My name is Tabitha Logan. I'm from Compassion Fest, and I am here with Casey Suhan and Dennis Henry Henley. Thank you so much for being here. I'm a big fan of all your films. Um, I'm also here with my sidekick, um, writer, journalist, Bryn Silver, David Bryn Silver. So hey thank guys. you for for. Oh, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for having us. <laughs> uh, so my my journey with the two of you, um, I was introduced to the the, the movie about the Wu Tang Clan, um, and that was about in 2006, Rock the Bells. Yeah. And then this brilliant piece, Bold Native, came out, and. Uh, yeah, I've been a fan ever since. And now this movie, The Animal People, um, about the Shack 7, and I'd love to hear all about it. I would much prefer to hear about you, but we can talk about the movies. <laughs> yeah. So Thank you, you so much. So maybe start off by telling us uh, who are the Shack 7 and why this movie was important for, for the two of you to make. Yeah. Do you want to take it, Dennis? you want to start off? Sure. So the Shack Seven um, were a group of actually six activists, and then the corporation, which was Shack USA, stood for Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty USA, and they were organized to protest a research facility called Huntington Life Sciences, and they organized this entire like protest globally, basically, to try to shut down this one lab, and it was really effective because instead of like activists putting their energies into a sort of broad idea, like let's stop animal testing. Um, they put it uh, onto one company and they were really intelligent in the sense that they took advantage of capitalism to say that most decisions that are made in capitalism have to do with the bottom line, has to do with dollars and cents. And so if we can make this company unprofitable to deal with, then people will stop dealing with it. And so instead of just appealing to people's ethics and morality, which they did as well, they also said, if you deal with Huntington Life Sciences as a company, you're gonna to have to deal with protest. And it's gonna be annoying, and it's probably gonna cost your company money because you'll wanna hire security guards and all this other stuff. And so basically all these companies that dealt with Huntington ended up racking up tons of bills and it became ultimately not worth it. And they almost put Huntington out of business multiple times until the government stepped in and saved Huntington because this was a very effective method that obviously they didn't want other activist groups to pick up on, um, which is pick one target, put all your energy on it and try to make them unprofitable. You know, company, you know activists have done this through boycotts, um, but when the company that you're protesting isn't selling like a consumer good, you can't really boycott it. But what you can do is you can you know, go after the financial pillars of support, which is what they did. So that's a very long answer, but just to say, uh, that's what the Shack case was about. And ultimately the government not only tried to save Huntington, but tried to put these activists who organized it uh, in jail as terrorists. Um, and they succeeded in doing that under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And um, the movie is about their story and we really think it's not just about this particular story, but about a general kind of blueprint that activists could use in any kind of campaign against a huge multinational corporate target, which um, I think is a blueprint that any activist group right now fighting for a number of things could, could pick up. So we hope that people see it for that reason. And one of the things that um, one of the gentlemen in the film, Jake Conroy, always says that I find really inspiring when he talks about the activism that they did, you know, they were young when they were doing this activism. They weren't um, super geniuses. They were all very smart. But you know what I mean? They, they, there was nothing superhuman about them. They were just smart, focused, committed individuals who were, you know, doing what anybody could do, Right using the internet to do research, um, thinking strategically about uh, what is holding a company together, and then saying, okay, well, a company needs insurance. A company, let's go after the people that are insuring them. Let's make that unprofitable. A company needs a bank. 
to keep it in business, you know, to, to, to hold its debt. Let's go after those banks. Let's make that unprofitable for them. So they were, there's, anybody can do this kind of activism. It's very approachable. Um, and it's, it's a pretty amazing story. And you've also, I mean, but part of the story is also um, sort of an introduction for viewers of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, mm -hmm. which is, and um, actually the three of us talked a thousand years ago um, yeah, I remember. about Bold Native. And like, I think, Casey, you, you used the phrase designer law, that, um, that the government sort of in partnership with corporate interests came up with a way to uh to label people terrorists um and i mean really in in a big picture this the movie this movie is sort of a a story about free freedom right and mm -hmm. like who gets to decide who has it and who controls it and all these things um and one of the things that struck me is um uh the sort of the complaints of the people who were uh whose homes were being sort of uh protested you know who are being protested in their homes complaining about what have you noise uh megaphones all this stuff and and in in sort of concert with using this word terrorist totally kind of using this linguistic wordplay and and victimhood to completely dismiss the victims right the animals who who are in these labs and i'm curious what you thought what your thoughts are about how do we sort of how do we sort of wake wake people up to uh these these methods that are that are used um, by corporate America, well, it, you know, globally, uh, in in sort of partnership with the government to make sure that that um, those who are actually the victims are not sort of part of the conversation, right? This becomes about oh, somebody threw a brick at my house or somebody, right? This is all about me, 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 it, uh, and we're in this period of time when everything is about me, 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 right? So how do we? If we were to fast forward this, what are we looking at? Well, I think that like, um, I'll just jump in quickly. I would say like, I think it has to do with the way, the way that we sort of move people's perspective is through continuing to talk about it. And ultimately, people reach a tipping point. I mean, we saw finally, way too late, obviously a tipping point happen around uh, policing and racial injustice this year. But those things have been on the protest block for hundreds of years. You know, <laughs> like people have been talking about and fighting those issues. And, you know, it took all the, the sort of growth, the evolution of all that fight for years and years to lead to this moment where a majority of people heard and saw, you know. And I think like it's the same with any social justice issue that basically you're just looking to continue to educate and fight for something. And I think people more and more now are, are waking up to the tricks that the government and corporations use that you talked about, David, you know, to try to like shift the attention and that kind of stuff. And I think they see it happening. And so, um, yeah, I think I mean, it's just we, a matter we, of time. We today in the New York Times, there's an article about people po uh, protesting outside of the new Postmaster General's office, uh, not office, his house. Yeah, I mean, that, that was happening in Los Angeles this year to protest the budget for the police um, in front of the mayor's house, you know, and it, right. I think there's a, people are much more understanding of why we need to bring these issues to people's front doorsteps. And, um, you know, they're, they're still calling them terrorists. Trump calls all these people terrorists still. That's going to happen. You can't, yeah. can't help it. It is what it is. You know, I think this the, the the home protest to me is such an effective tactic because, like you mentioned, David, I think that we tend to um, separate like what we do in our our work life. We make decisions that have real repercussions in the lives of other humans and animals and the environment. 
Um, and then we go home to like our, our cushy existence and our Amazon packages and whatever, you know, and um, home protest is really like linked to that idea that you are accountable for your decisions no matter where you go. And I think constantly reminding people that, that, um, that there are people behind these decisions that corporations make or that um, special interest groups are making, you know, that departments are making. Um, I, I, th I think it's on, it's the part of the activists to make sure to constantly point, you know, at what the struggle is about and remind people. And video is obviously a powerful tool yeah. in that, you know, and um, now we live in a time when, when everything, we can distribute that kind of information on the internet. When the shack was just getting started, the internet was a brand new thing. It was a brand new tool that they use brilliantly. Um, and now we can, you know, distribute information and remind people like, and keep it, you have to, I think, just keep, keep it present, you know, and I think that's what gets to the tipping point. I think there was some, there was some discussion in the movie about, uh, in the film, I should say, about the decentralized nature of the campaign. And it got me thinking a little bit about the sort of pre- pre-Facebook kind of pre-social media um, world and whether, like what are your thoughts about how the, the, the campaign website became sort of a message board mm -hmm. for activists everywhere? And there was some, some, some lament about that um, on behalf of some of the, um, the Shack 7, right? Well, it, it was the, the message board. Do you mean just the distribution of information via their website? Not how, that kind of not thing? how they were distributing information, but how they were sharing information that was coming into them from other activists around the world. Right. And they were sharing it without editor, editorializing it, right? Yeah, right. Um, so the question is... I think the question is, I think Tabitha and I were, were sort of thinking along the same lines on this about like, you know... Uh, the, the, well, there. Was, I can't remember um, who in the film made this observation, but they they sort of reflected back on this and thought about like, you know, could we have tweaked that better? You know, was was that was the fact that Tabitha? Am I am I capturing it right? Yeah, like I, I was thinking, you know, um, did it help the campaign or did it hurt the cam campaign? Pain, um, for people to have that like open forum available for everybody and you know with everybody having a different idea of what activism looks like and how it should be done I mean I guess I would say what do you think Tabitha <laughs> you think it helped the campaign or hurt the campaign I mean well, truly like when we made the film we weren't trying to answer those questions we were just raising well, that I was gonna so. leave you a very a <laughs> very big question that I have for the two of you is I was wondering what kind of movie that you were setting out to do I think that first off the two of you together like create this like you're a powerhouse and this movie is revolutionary to me and I think it's gonna go down in history because it is very relevant of the times right now with the BLM movement and the protesting that's happening and I, I was wondering what the process was was this going to be a movie about um, uh, the First Amendment you know freedom of speech was it going to be about uh, the the animal enterprise terrorism act or was it going to be about activism I was wondering how uh, you know the art of the process how did it all come together I think it was about all of those things, right? And I think the, the conversation that we often had was um, what is effective activism? You know, I think we like to think and, and, and kind of um, edit history as far as how change happens. But when you really examine how change happens, it's, it's messy and it's complicated. And, um, and I think that if there's a lot in the world, um, including how animals are treated, that we need to try to be working on and changing. And is it all gonna be butterflies and rainbows? I don't think that that's what history has shown.
history has shown that it's called a struggle for a reason. And um, so I think the kinds of conversations, we always talked about what kind of conversations do we want people to have after they watch this movie? And that was one of them. And when we were testing the movie with people and we would see them debate about, well, this is wrong. No, that's okay. That's acceptable. No, that's wrong. That was when we knew like we were getting closer to the movie we were trying to make because it should absolutely spark discussions like that. The other thing we thought about a lot was in, in a lot of ways, this movie is about the nature of power, you know, um, both from the power that the, the laboratory technician wields over the animal. She's um, uh, tormenting, you know, experimenting on to the power that uh, corporations have over our lives and the lives of sentient animals and the environment to the power that the government has over each one of us, but also the power that the people, <laughs> but truly the power that the people have when they organize and work. So it, it's, it's like kind of dissecting and, and asking people to think about power and what we do with it when we have it. I absolutely think too that like the, the open nature of the website uh, was absolutely integral to the success of the campaign because it showed people what was possible. It like said, hey, we did this thing, we did this thing, we did this thing. And some of it maybe crossed people's ethical lines. And in the current situation um, where people can respond on Facebook and whatever, you know, our, our subjects, the defendants, the activists in the case said, well, you know, the community would kind of police itself and say, hey, I think that action went too far or this action I think is a bit questionable and there'd be more back and forth. At this point in the internet, it was more just like coming out of the internet. Yeah. You know, people would send things into the campaign and they would put it up and there wasn't the commenting aspect available. And so things would go up and people at home might be, oh crap, I can't believe they did that. I don't think that, I feel weird about that, some of the actions. Um, but I do think that that open nature show people what's possible. And like Casey's saying, change happens, it's messy. And I don't think it's just the past, I think it's also the present. Like with the particular you know, uh, action this year on racial injustice and policing, like to my mind, like that moment a few days into the protests in Minneapolis, when they took over the police station and the police abandoned it, and there was those pictures of like the activists taking over the police station was like the moment where people looked at that and were like, oh, anything's possible this time. This is different. Like there's possibility here because that's never happened before. And it was at that moment when things started to like, people were taking more chances then in different cities. And they were like, maybe not taking over a police station, but they were like felt empowered. And I think when we see other activists do something, go farther than we thought that we could get, and succeed that's inspiring to people and so like i think even if you're not the people that break the law because you can't because you're uncomfortable with it or because you know you have responsibilities to children or whatever you can't go to jail like to see other people do that i think opens up our understanding of what what can happen how far change can go it's also so i think it's really important thinking thinking about what what casey you said a few minutes ago about uh, or, or maybe Dennis, you said I'm um, getting old, obviously. Uh, the, you know, that the protests outside people's homes, and yeah, Casey, you said you know we we get to we get to before March, you know, go go to work and then come home and leave work at work and home <laughs> is home, but that's not the case with the animals in these laboratories, and so there's sort of a, a deeply uncomfortable, you know. When 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 I was watching Darius Dagnar, is that is that the, the gentleman's Dagdar, yeah. Yeah, uh, Dagdar. Um you know, I'm getting divorced because these people are outside and they're yelling and blah da 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 da. And and yet, like he's he's you know, his complaint is 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 trivial compared to, you know, what's happening to these animals in these laboratories, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a really complicated moment and a complicated scene in the movie, I think, too, because um, I, I think what comes, people have already seen the movie when they're watching this, right? Yes. Unclear. Um, 
I, I've told fair. everybody okay. to see the movie, and I, I think that <laughs> I think <laughs> everybody I know has seen the movie okay. at this point. <laughs> I mean, I find that moment to be really interesting because I, I think there's so many uh, revealing things happening there. And to me, it's so much of the lies we tell ourselves just in order to to get through with the day-to-day -day that we've somehow found ourselves in. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's like almost this kind of, uh, PTSD isn't the right word, but this denial and this, this over, the, the way he talks about it is just over explaining it in order to justify it, right? Like I had a lot of, I thought that was a really, one of the most fascinating interviews that- What that was it like to be there? What's that? What, what was it like to be there, uh, just to sort of be with, with him and having that conversation? I mean, listen, I had a lot of empathy for, and I'm sure people don't want to hear that, but I had a lot of empathy for him and reading the trial before even we ever met any of the Shaq defendants. Um, I had a lot of empathy. The, the government, first of all, did a glorious job <laughs> in creating this, this picture that the defense didn't really have the opportunity to push back on at trial. So when you read the transcripts, it's just very artfully manipulated to put you on the side of the um, quote unquote victims in this case. But I think, you, you know, when you think about it, a lot of these folks probably never thought of, like a lot of people don't think past, um, that I'm not saying they don't think deep, but they haven't been forced to really examine these kinds of issues. I mean, a lot of these people were bankers you know what I mean? Or working at an insurance company or whatever. And so suddenly they have a group of passionate young people who in Dariush's words are a little scruffy looking, you know, chanting in front of their house. Like I think there was probably a lot of confusion. But um, the other thing that they had was the government and the police kind of whispering in their ears that this group was really super dangerous. So the opportunity for a conversation, which happened on occasion, the movie doesn't talk about it because the movie is more about, you know, how the government um, uh, chose certain actions to paint this picture, right? To convict these um, individuals and try to stop thus the entire campaign by doing so, really. There was like a bigger picture here. Um, but you know, they, they had people telling them, people in positions of authority telling them, hey, you should be really scared. And you can die. Out, like, yeah. No, flyer. So here. So you got to feel empathy. So, yeah. so as we were talking to him and, and I, whenever I interview anybody, I try to, and, and I think Dennis is, I think our interviews are a little different styles and I think it's always good when we're working together because he pushes a little harder. Dennis, and I Dennis is the bad that. cop. <laughs> What's that? Dennis is the bad cop and you're the good cop. Is yeah, that probably. Right. Yeah. It's a good combo. Um, so it was, it was fascinating and complex and um, I just thought there was, what was going on with him was so layered and says a lot about how humans think and how we get to the point where we do things that when you look at it, when we, those of you who are watching this movie can step back outside of it and see it from a distance, right? And go like that, what he's saying doesn't make any sense. He's just talking in circles, but that's what we do in order to do buy the things we want to buy and not think about who's it's effect, who it's affecting. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, it's such a human moment, I think, in the film. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a, there was a moment for me, I think it was Dar uh, Darius that was talking, talking about um, how there are these barricades during the protest and how there was a, like a freedom of speech section. And he's like, shouldn't the whole world be a freedom of speech zone? That really, really touched me. I'm paraphrasing Absolutely. here. But. And to your point, Tabitha, like we always thought about the film as a First Amendment film yeah. as well. Like thinking about how, how important that amendment is and those rights are in order to push for change in this country. And, you know, seeing that get whittled away, I think was really disturbing. Um, so that was something that we definitely like tried to tell the story of, particularly with, you know, um, Lauren was a great voice for talking about the, the, the legal 
you know, aspect of what they were doing and why they should have been protected by the First Amendment. And when Will Potter's obviously been writing about this stuff, you know, all along with the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act and, and all that. Um, it's, it's great to see him. Yeah. He came in basically, you know, at the end to sort of tie a lot of things together for us. I mean, Casey and I, to answer your earlier question, we started on this right after we made Bold Native, which is a film about people who actually do break the law for uh, animal rights. Um, and we toured that movie around the country and we wanted to have activists speak at the screenings. And this was around the time that some of the shack defendants were just getting out of jail. And so we were meeting them as they were, you know, we would meet them, they would come and speak at the screenings. And um, we got the opportunity to get a bunch of footage that was shot by, you know, two of the producers on this movie during the campaign. And so we then took over the project and interviewed all the defendants as they got out and worked on the film for 10 years, basically from the time we finished Bold Native to this, doing other things, of course. But, you know, I think part of what made it made us keep at it was that if we would get bored with one section of it, there was always something else it was about. Like if we got tired of thinking about the government repression aspect, there'd be the, the animal rights aspect, or then there'd be the First Amendment aspect. There's, it does cover so many different topics that it was something that could always like spark our interest again and, and get it finished. Right. And, you know, I think if, if you don't know anything about the Shaq campaign, um, you watch this film and you would think, oh, it's all home protests and um, spray painting and <laughs> petty vandalism or whatever. But it wasn't just that, right? There was, we see some of the marching um, that they did in cities um, and protesting like outside actual corporations. But there was also letter writing campaigns that like grandmas in Florida took on upon themselves because they were, you know, moved to action when they saw that, um, that fo footage that was just so um, inciting, you know? Yeah. So and you have to think about like, also like, you know, people that work in the government always say like, it makes a difference when you call because it really does. If you're sitting in one office and you know, you're fielding like hundreds of calls, it feels like the whole country is coming down on you. And I think for these companies, if there was somebody, when they went home, if there were seven kids out there protesting at their home, they came in the next day and there was 30 letters from grandmas in Florida, and then somebody's calling their phone, like all those things happening at the same time makes it feel overwhelming. And I think activists often don't realize that the power of like targeting at a thing from a lot of different angles and how that, you know, not all those, not all those activities are like aggressive or in your face, you know, the letters can be very... Yeah, I think that's a really important, I think that's a really important point because there, there is a lot of discussion about what's effective and, uh, you know, and the other, on, on another sort of side of that question is what is, what does one individual feel comfortable doing versus another individual, right? Like what is authentic to me might, might be, might not be quite as authentic for you, all these kinds of things. And I think it's really important to remember that, that, as you're saying, Dennis, that this, it's a cumulative, uh, it's a cumulative approach that, that was taken here and probably is, is what's, what's needed, right? Is letter writing, is calling, is marching, is protesting. But right? having, like a, having like one target makes that work. Like yeah. it, if it's, so if it's, it's just, you're like, you know, let's write letters to, you know, people who abuse animals. <laughs> it's like, there's more people who abuse animals than people who want to write letters to them. So everybody will get less than one letter, you know? <laughs> but if you like put everybody's attention on one thing, and the thing is, it's like, if you beat one company that way, that has a domino effect. And I think that's what the government was so afraid of. They could not let Shaq beat HLS. It could not happen because if that happened, it's anything a, is yeah. possible. It's, it's the perfect. kids coming out of the Minneapolis Police Department with the flag saying we own this place now it's you can't let people see what's possible right. and that's where like when the law was sort of enacted the animal enterprise terrorism act on the heels of sort of the patriot act this was when the government was sort of weaponizing fear as a as a right as a, a as a tool to remember i mean in the film too right uh you're either with us or you're with the terrorists, right? Absolutely. So you've got to choose. It's it's by it's a you know, um, 
And you know, yeah. um, in the film, Inhofe, who is still, <laughs> I don't understand how still he's office, done it for so long. It's insane. Um, but Inhofe office. says, if we don't, what will happen if the activists start to go after the timber industry or the um, other controversial industries, right? The gas and oil industry. Like, what will happen if we let this stand? We have to, we have to put a stop to this. We have to make a, an example here. And you know, you see it right now in Milwaukee. I've been talking to this incredible activist in the BLM movement who um, was uh, indicted in 2018 with very similar kinds of accusations, you know, and still hasn't seen any of the discovery against him. But the same kind of like terrorist incitement, you know, the same things. It's, it's not just happening in the animal rights movement, right, right? right? Like these, these were tactics that were absolutely honed then. But to talk to somebody and hear it, the playbook, playing out in his life, you know, and how that's affecting how the community sees him and what he's able, and not the community that he works with, but the outsiders, right? How they view him and how um, that affects his ab ability to raise money to do the on, the on the ground work that he does in his community is just, it's, it's incredibly it's, effective federal um, tactics. It's also the community, is, right? That you're, it's also like the community of activists because there is a chilling effect. When yeah. people look at other activists and see the government come down hard on one or two of them, it makes everybody be like, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. And everybody starts to, starts to like modulate their activity. I mean, that's absolutely speaking of And they're very careful about their choices. I'm sorry to interrupt you, David, but they, they certainly are trying, it's not like they're going after easy targets, people they know that don't have the resources to fight back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's expensive to fight a federal indictment. And, um, and it's just, it's, it's, the whole thing is so sinister. Well, you've been following the case of the two lawyers that are like potentially facing life in prison for that Molotov cocktail thing this summer. Have yeah. I haven't that? really been following it. No, no I, I, I know of it. It's crazy. It's basically, I mean, these, these two lawyers are, I mean, they're lawyers. They've gone, <laughs> they're very, very smart. They're very educated. Um, they do a lot of great work in the community and for people. And, um, they were part of the protests this summer, and apparently they, they're accused of throwing a Molotov cocktail um, into an empty police vehicle that was broken down and abandoned during one of the protests. Um, obviously not putting anybody at risk, a little bit of property destruction, and they're both facing, I think, potentially life in prison right now for that. Hmm. And it's just like, it, it's, a, it's, it's insane. Like, and you know, um, Casey's absolutely right. The Shaq case was a uh, was a workshop for this kind of political repression, and it's definitely you know blooming at this point. Got that. And a workshop against a very disenfranchised, like a very fringe movement. So it was super easy to do, right? Like um, the the animal rights movement has gotten much more mainstream now, but. In 1999, early 2000s, you know, um, it, it was just easier to go after a group like this. I'm sorry, David, what were you going to no, say? No, I was going to say it uh, sort of apropos of this, of this line of thinking is that the, the FBI um, chief Carey, Thomas Carey, there's a line in the film and where he says, we're going to be as creative as, as we possibly no. can in bringing, in bringing charges. I mean, just the thought that, you know, we are going to be creative in our application of, uh, of, of you know, the law. And uh, I, I feel like this was a perfect storm, uh, this happening during the, the Cheney-Bush administration. But I, am I right when I say that, like, um, they, those that were charged, they were never able to speak about the case, right? Why they were doing this. Was, it, was that right? Well, they could have taken the stand. Josh Harper took the stand during oh, the trial. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think on advice of their lawyers and also out of fear that, uh, and Dennis, jump in if, if I'm getting this wrong, I think out of fear that they might uh, say something that might be detrimental to somebody else, you know, like I think there was just a lot of... Um, mostly advice from their lawyers that they not take the stand. So they could have, they could have, but they would have opened themselves up to, you know, questioning. 
I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's common practice that defendants don't take the stand. Most lawyers will tell their client not to take the stand. Um, and then, yeah, when you have on top of that, like Casey's saying, if the government says to you, well, okay, so you, you were at this protest, who else was there with you? Exactly. Uh, you either are up for perjury or you're, in, you know, implicating other people. And I think that they were concerned about that. And I think that their lawyers um, were irrationally optimistic about their chances. You know, they felt like the government had not proven its case and the government hadn't proven its case legally, but it had certainly proven it emotionally to the jurors. Masterfully. And, you know, I think <laughs> one thing that, then they only called, the, the defense only took one day and they didn't call very many people. And I think if they had called more people, I mean, they were hamstrung. I think what you're talking about in part is that the, the judge did say you cannot talk about animal testing. You cannot talk about animal rights. You cannot talk about any of the reasons why you did this. So they wanted to call experts to say, hey, you've been hearing that HLS, because the government did talk about it. They did say, hey, HLS does life-saving research. And that's what the jury thought. This company does life-saving research, and these kids are trying to stop them from doing life-saving research, which, of course, that seems crazy. And so the defense wanted to call somebody to say, hey, this isn't life-saving research. It's product testing, and the medical research that's being done is questionable. But they weren't allowed to call those witnesses. And if they had gone on stand and tried to talk about those things like Josh did, they would be shut down, which is what happened. So like, yes, they were, they were, they were definitely gagged in that way, for sure, from uh -huh. talking about why, which is, you know, at the heart, it's, it's what we, we have this romantic idea, thanks to like, you know, the trials of the past that like, or in also TV, that like, you know, political trials are going to give defendants an opportunity to sort of like, make their case and the federal you know court system is designed to not let that happen they yeah, also they, just they, overwhelmed the defense with so much discovery i mean we were fortunate enough to gain access to it and it took us i can't i don't even years literal years to go through it and I, we probably didn't go through every single bit of it you know so they just they overwhelm you and then they the way they presented this um, website that was colorful and had a sense of humor you know they printed out pages of it and then photocopied it <laughs> like several times and then made sure that the pictures if there was a picture of a mutilated animal or something on it in color they made sure to black that out that you couldn't see that and so you end up looking at these like multiple multiple times photographed copies of a website in black and white it looked so sinister yeah. right like the whole presentation was um like i said masterfully designed to to get the jury you know um emotionally against these individuals that they never got a chance to hear speak. I found it particularly ominous is the wrong word, but toward the end when HLS goes through its sort of name change and branding change. Yeah. And here's the here's the woman running through the field of sunflowers. With the with the with the music playing in the background, you know, yeah. the fresh flowers. And, and, and then the, yeah. the the head of the of the organization says, So we've got a night of drinking and gambling, right? Oh. Um, I don't is that what he says? He says something That's exactly like what he says. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the time right now and I and I don't want to hold you you two hostage and I'm extremely I'm eternally grateful for this. So thank you so much for for giving me the time. Um, for those who haven't seen the animal people, uh, don't wait any longer. Get out there, watch this very powerful movie. This is going to go down in history. Um, thank you so much, Casey. Um, thank you, Dennis. Thank and you. one last question. What can we expect from the two of you next? Oh, my gosh. There's a lot of things kicking around right now from both documentary to scripted. So, you know, Bold Native was a scripted piece yeah. that had some documentary elements to it. Um, we've got some, I think we both have some different scripted projects that we're um, working on and some documentaries as well. So I don't know which is going to go first. <laughs> we'll see.
Well, I hope to have you here in New Haven. And I had this idea of treating the two of you to the vegan Ahava food trucks. So we're going to have to make that happen in the future. Yes, definitely post COVID. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks again. You guys have a great night. Thank you. You too. Thanks.